So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here at this meeting in honor of uh, Michael, known Michael for many, many years. And we have interacted for good or for bad, or both, uh, most intensively in the course of the Sunrise Project which has never been an easy project, but in the end, quite successful, I think. So I was given the task of talking about Sunrise 3, which is, as you say in German, future music. You know, the music is still to be made. But I decided that isn't going, quite going to do justice. So I want to talk about Sunrise 1, 2, and 3. because Sunrise 1 and 2 have actually flown already. Now, Sunrise has caused Michael, I think, a lot of headache, a lot of pain, lots of white hair. Um, but it's also given him something, I think. And just before coming here, I checked Michael's publications. And nearly 60% of all his refereed journal papers are Sunrise papers. So it has been important. It has been very important in my life. But it's also obviously been important for Michael, at least for the scientific point of view. So let's start with Sunrise 1 and 2. I'll tell you a little bit what it was what came out, and then go on to what we are doing for Sunrise 3. So today morning, we heard about telescopes which were 1.5 meters in diameter, 1.6 or 7, 4 meters mirrors. Here we have something comparatively small, just 1 meter. However, it's 1 meter not on the ground, but floating high up in the stratosphere. And that makes it the biggest solar telescope ever to leave the ground. In Sunrise 1 and 2, the instrumentation was very similar. We had two instruments. One SUFI is a UV filter imager. UV meaning between 200 and 400 nanometers. You can't go below 200 without actually going to space. And even there is a bit of a gap between 2 and 300 where you can't observe. But you cannot go down there from the ground. And the other instrument, uh, IMAX, is an imaging magnetograph. Uh, which observes in this well-known G equals 3 line at 50 to 50 angstroms. And the important thing is that both instruments can observe simultaneously because they're each getting all the light um, at their respective wavelengths. Then you have to stabilize the whole thing. For that, there is a correlating wavefront sensor. And finally, you have a protective and stabilizing gondola, and that was the main contribution from HAO, besides providing the whole contacts with uh, the Columbia Scientific Ballooning Facility and making sure that we actually could fly, because Sunrise is big and heavy enough that the only balloons with which you can do long duration flights are owned and run by NASA. So there is no other alternative. So here are some pictures of Sunrise 1 and 2. and. This should be a movie that was running just a few minutes ago. And let's see if it works now. No. OK. Well, so much for that. That makes my talk two minutes shorter. Very good. Um, so we launched from Kiruna in northern Sweden. That's uh, just slightly above the Arctic Circle. Um, this is, you've seen pictures like this before. This is what it looked like. Sunrise, the shiny white thing. Most of what you see in these pictures is actually the gondola that was built by, by HAO. The telescope itself is quite hidden in the middle. Um, this is what it looked like shortly after launch, going up, spending a few hours till it reaches nearly 40 kilometers. Um, and then you're above 99% of the Earth's atmosphere, which is the reason that you fly, so that you don't have to worry about seeing and things like that. And finally, it was brought down in Canada 
uh, these are uh, planned uh, endings where you decide this is the place and you have a little charge that you detonate between the balloon and the parachute and then it comes down over there. In principle, uh, these flights are always made in June because you see the sun day and night, but also because there is a polar vortex. You have a steady flow of air around the poles. So in principle, you could fly all the way around the Earth and come back again uh, with just one. And in the Antarctic, they do that. Uh, but in the Arctic, um, no balloons have managed to do that because uh, if they go on a little bit, they go into Siberia. And balloons do go into Siberia, but they never come out. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so they were brought down, and luckily Canada has all these islands going all the way up um, into the you know, very far north, so whatever the wind conditions your chances are you can bring it down unless you're out of luck and then you, 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 know, you could also hit the Northwest Passage and you could in principle go all the way through. And we were a bit worried about that with the first flight, but it turned out okay. Uh, and then you're brought down with a parachute and this is what it looks like after it has landed. This was a relatively soft landing, right? There have been much worse landings than this. If you're above 70 degrees north in latitude, even a mild day is not terribly mild usually. So you often have strong winds, shear winds, whatever thing comes down and it just flies on like that. Luckily, the parachute is released automatically immediately when it touches the ground. If that mechanism doesn't work, then very likely your instrument is going to be dragged till it crashes into the next rock, which is not good for sensitive optical equipment. So although it looked like this, and this we were expecting things to go wrong, the gondola did its job, right? The most sensitive parts, this is the main mirror. It's a one meter mirror. It's 35 kilos. That's a very, very light weighted mirror, right? These struts are two millimeters thick. Um, it could break like anything. And it hit the ground hard, fell over, the gondola did its job, the mirror cell did its job, the mirror survived. This is by far the most expensive single uh, piece of equipment, and that's why we have a chance to fly it again. That's why we had a chance to fly Sunrise 2, and now again Sunrise 3. And, of course, we got data, which was a wonderful thing. Um, the data are, so what you see here is a continuum at 300 nanometers and below that calcium, which you probably lose all the structure in the, in the projection, uh, calcium K, or no, sorry, calcium H in, in, in blue at the bottom. So the lower, the lower photosphere in the upper one in red and the lower chromosphere in blue. We are diffraction limited at 300 nanometers, which means it's very similar in quality to what you get with much larger telescopes on the ground because you're at much longer wavelengths in general, right? I mean, the diffraction limited images we were seeing were in the green or in the red. Okay, unfortunately, the movie on the, um, the launch didn't work because it was a very serene, very well-managed launch. This one doesn't make much sense without seeing the other one because it doesn't always work like that. This was another launch, this is not Sunrise, thank God, <laughs> where things went slightly wrong, right? And no, I tell you, I mean, if, if you have worked six, seven years building that thing, you don't laugh. You don't laugh, oh no. And I could feel for these guys so much. I could feel for these guys so much. It can happen anytime, right? So even for Sunrise 3, we have to be worried. Okay, but we got data. We got beautiful data and we have results. So, so far, um, we have had well over 100 papers in referee journals, and there are still papers being written. Actually, one was submitted just two days ago. Um, and to my knowledge, the solar balloon born mission with the most papers before sunrise was seven, right? seven publications. So, we are an order of magnitude better than what has been done before. Another comparison, and I ask forgiveness from Harold. 
<laughs> is uh, with Sophia. That's this uh, beautiful big jumbo, a NASA and DLR uh, collaboration, which also has roughly the same amount of publications, but just if I got the costs correctly, is more than a factor of 20 more expensive. So we are good as far as banks per buck is concerned. <laughs> right. Um, so, our main aim with the first flight was to finally resolve these kilogauss magnetic fields, which we know are there all over the sun. They are in small elements, and we wanted to resolve them in the magnetic field, in their thermal structures, and that was one big success we had, we did. We could, without introducing anything like a filling factor as people had been doing before, we got the kilogauss fields, we got the heating in the upper atmosphere, um, and that showed that even in the internetworks and the very quiet sun, you had such elements which were of an order of 50 to 100 kilometers in diameter. In the meantime, and you've looked at the data more carefully, you've realized you have not resolved all of them. There actually are bright points where we don't see the thousand gauss, where we actually have weaker. And we know from MHD simulations, you don't get these strong bright points if you have a much weaker field. So obviously there are smaller guys which have not been resolved. That's something that DKIST can do, I'm sure, um, at some point. Oh, I know why that movie was not working. This is the old version of the talk. <laughs> ha! We had that already today, right? No, I don't know if I want to try and look because this is probably not going to go well. And I will see if I find, ah, you were listening. Great, thank you. Because you'll probably find it much faster than me. It isn't here. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you did download it. Yeah, 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 and we've added the movies and everything, so it must be somewhere. Yeah, I can see there are at least four versions of the talk here, right? Okay, why don't I just continue with the old one? I think it's, don't worry. Yeah, sorry, my fault, because I updated the talk, and this is. Okay, well, I start again at the beginning, right? When... Not touch anything. <laughs> Otherwise, it's the rest of the meeting is lost, right? <laughs> okay, now, let's see if it works. Uh, no, okay, who cares, right? Let's just continue. There's lots more exciting stuff coming. Um, oh God, why? Uh, this is still my old talk, yes. This is maybe another version of the old talk, I don't know, but it's my old talk. Yeah, in a parallel universe, right? There is a much better Sami Solanke giving a much better talk. It's a very parallel universe. Okay. Um, Next slide, yeah, okay. This is what that movie on the side, which has gone all crap, is supposed to do something else. Um, so another thing that we could do is follow the dynamics because you're not worried about seeing changing anything. Right? So you can follow the dynamics because we are observing different layers. We could follow magnetic features over the whole height from the, from the solar surface into the lower chromosphere and then you know you make this little stick model of that thing and you see how it not just it dances about but it changes its shape and you can check that what it means and you can see that these are actually partly some of them are waves which are traveling up these are transverse waves you see um, and things like that so that was um, a fun discovery uh, we could make 
And then just another one or two results from Sunrise 2, where we flew the same instrumentation, but at a different time, right? So Sunrise 1, we flew in 2009, which was a time which according to all predictions, solar activity should have been on the rising phase. It turned out it was the deepest minimum we had had for 100 years, a very extended long minimum. So we got beautiful, very quiet sun data. So we flew again in 2013 to try and catch more activity, and we did get some activity. So here are observations of uh, part of an active region. And one of the things, uh, there was a discussion earlier about extrapolations of magnetic field, and that the problem is um, that you don't, um, going from the photosphere into the upper atmosphere because you're doing force-free magnetic fields and the field is not force-free in the photosphere. Uh, so Thomas Wiegelmann um, at MPS, he has been developing a magnetostatic equilibria where you can take into account the forces on the magnetic field in the lower atmosphere, which was very important because we were looking at very small scale things and we wanted to see how the field changes over the first few hundred kilometers in the atmosphere. And he came up with maps like you see at the top there where colors represent um, inclination, so blue being nearly vertical, red being nearly horizontal. Um, we could compare this with what we were seeing in the lower chromosphere in the calcium line and with the magnetic field that was measured. And we saw indeed that there where you have uh, horizontal fields, you have long fibrils in calcium, where you have the more vertical fields, you have a much more, um, how should I say, um, not so well aligned, uh, you have shorter, um, uh, more chaotic uh, structure of the fibrils. Also, you found waves along all of them, everywhere. There was no fibril at no time that was not showing uh, both transverse and longitudinal waves carrying quite a bit of energy. So you could easily heat the chromosphere uh, with these waves in there. So, but the interesting thing is not chromospheric heating, right? The, the question we want to answer, or one of the main questions in solar physics is what is heating the corona? And there have classically been two proposals. One, a very old one, the waves. And we saw it today morning in, uh, in, in, in Joanne and, Teef's, and Steve's talk um, how many waves you see uh, in, the, in the corona, alphane waves, or whatever exact name they have, what type they are exactly. Uh, and waves have been around a long time to uh, propose to heat the corona. Then Gene Parker in the 80s uh, proposed something quite different. He said, well, I have all these magnetic fields and they are embedded in a turbulent medium, so they're going to be moved around and you get braiding. So where you have magnetic field lines crossing each other at a certain angle, you get current sheets and you get dissipation. And that's another very interesting um, way of heating the corona. Uh, the trouble is there's no really strong evidence for how well these things work. Anyway, with Sunrise, we found some observational evidence that there may also be a third way of pumping energy into the corona. And just to show why it was important that we did these observations with Sunrise at the high resolution, what I'm showing here, sorry, I should uh, do this with the pointer. So on the, on the right, you see uh, plasma at around 1 million degrees. This is taken with the AIA instrument. It's a snapshot of a part of an active region, AIA instrument on SDO. And on the left, you see in this little black square in the middle, you see the magnetogram there taken by HMI, which is another instrument on the SDO spacecraft. This is only a small field of view. The reason I'm showing you this field of view is that this is the same as we then see with Sunrise with the IMAX instrument. And now I'm going to show you the exactly the same thing again, but go from HMI to IMAX. And you immediately see there's an order of magnitude that you gain in spatial resolution. Right? 
And then you start seeing, if you look at these little circles in there, what you, if you look very, very carefully, you might notice it in HMI that there is a little bit of opposite polarity. But with IMAX, it's really clear, right? You have dominant polarities, black, this long line of black over here is the dominant polarity, which is the foot points of all these loops over here. That's that line. On the other side, they all come together because there is a sunspot over there. But if you look carefully, you'll find all over the place that there are also white patches in there. So there is opposite polarity next to this dominant uh, polarity over there. And so a picture that was emerging at the same time what we also saw, which I'm not showing here, is that there where you have these opposite polarities, the fields are coming together very often, they are merging, or rather they're canceling. You see jets of chromospheric material, which we saw in the, in the calcium line, shooting up in one direction, in the direction towards the, where the, the loops are. So what we are proposing is that magnetic loops are not always as simple as the picture you usually have, that they're just connecting one polarity to the other, but that it's not just a huge structure, unipolar at one end, but you also have opposite polarity sprinkled in there, which is interacting with the dominant polarity, causing reconnection to happen, and reconnection jets to shoot material up into the, into the coronal loop and providing hot material in the corona so that the heating is happening actually very low down in the atmosphere. Okay, so much for the results we got from Sunrise 1 and 2. In Sunrise 3, what do we want to do? Now, one disadvantage of Sunrise 1 and 2 was that we were looking at a relatively narrow range of heights from the solar surface, basically till the upper end of the photosphere, maybe low chromosphere, that's about it. So that's shown in this uh, diagram here on the, on the lower right. This is a cartoon published by Sven Wedemeyer and uh, uh, collaborators in a review they wrote for, for ISI. Uh, you just see how complex the whole thing is. And with Sunrise 1 and 2, we were just probing this light green shaded area, uh, so a relatively narrow range of heights. With Sunrise 3, with new instrumentation, we want to cover a much bigger range of heights. We want to cover basically most of the chromosphere and with the help of long time series, we also want to look a bit deeper into the sun itself. Not very deep, but at high resolution, do some kind of helios, local helioseismology that has not been possible so far. And to do that, cover this range of heights, we need new instruments. So there will be three instead of two instruments on Sunrise 3. The first of these is a tunable magnetograph. So this is based roughly on the design of IMAX but covers multiple spectral lines, photospheric and chromospheric, and it will take vector magnetograms um, <coughs> at different uh, wavelengths. It's led by uh, a Spanish team with contributions from uh, German and Japanese colleagues, and the PI of this instrument is Jose Carlos del Toro Iniesta. Sorry, in the Ah, it is here, okay. So this is a sort of in-between version, I think, of the talk. I'm beginning to learn what version of the talk this actually is. <coughs> um, okay, this is just the design. I'm not going to spend time on this. Then the second instrument is the Sunrise Chromospheric Infrared Spectropolarimeter, or SKIP. This is being provided by a Japanese consortium or under the lead of a Japanese consortium led by Yukio Katsukawa with contributions from the Sp Spanish and the Germans. Um, and uh, this, as the name says, is going to observe the sun in the infrared. So you see two wavelength ranges up there. These are the two they're going to look at. Um, the one on the left that has two of the calcium infrared lines in there, which are strong chromospheric lines. It also has a bunch of photospheric lines in there, in including one which has a Londe factor of 2.5. That means it's very sensitive to magnetic fields, especially at these long wavelengths. Uh, the other wavelength band is an interesting one. So if you look at it, 
all those, or most of the lines you see there are actually telluric absorption lines. That means this is a very rarely observed part of the spectrum because you're just wasting your time. You're mainly observing the Earth's atmosphere. But if you're up at nearly 40 kilometers, these telluric absorptions are still there, but they're very weak. And you can get rid of them easily in the data processing afterwards. We have tried that. And so what you find are you can observe unblended uh, two potassium lines, which are relatively strong as solar lines. And the nice thing is that they cover the height range between the part that is sensitive that the calcium lines see and the iron lines see. And in between, there's a part which is not well covered. So this instrument, by this clever com combination, can cover a large part of the photosphere and chromosphere, albeit at a somewhat lower resolution than instruments working at shorter wavelengths. And this is sort of the design. You see that hardware has been bought and things are being built as we speak. The third instrument is the Sunrise UV Spectropolarimetric Imager, or SUSI for short. And this covers the wavelength range from 300 to 420 nanometers, roughly. Um, this is a very, very heavily populated wavelength range for which we know almost nothing about the spectropolarimetric, especially the polarimetric properties. There are literally thousands and thousands of spectral lines there are actually hundreds of chromospheric spectral lines. So what you see in the image on the lower, so on the upper right, is a small part of the spectrum. This is the kind of spectral range that we will get with one shot uh, of the spectrometer. So you have Stokes I at the top, Stokes V in the middle, and Q and U um, plotted at the bottom over there. Um, you get lines, although I was really surprised. This is in the UV. But because the lines are very deep and very sharp, you get huge signals in Stokes V, right? Huge signals, 10, 20 percent, if you have, if you resolve the magnetic features. Right? Um, and in addition to that, I mean, this is theory, right? We will find out how it really looks once we have flown. Uh, in addition to that, you also have hundreds, literally hundreds, of um, chromospheric spectral lines compared to half a dozen or something like that in the visible. Unexplored, right? How much information there is in there, we don't know. So it's very much an exploratory instrument to try and find out what can we learn from this part of the solar spectrum, which is really, really tough to get from the ground. This is the design at the moment, but again, I'm not going to say very much about that. Beyond that, there is a correlating um, correlation tracker and wavefront sensor, which is, so, sorry, uh, the SUSI instrument is being led by, by MPS, and the person who is responsible for it is Alex Feller. Um, and then there is, oops, here, the correlation tracker and wavefront sensor uh, being built by uh, Kiepenheuer Institute, and the lead there is with Thomas Berkefeld. This will be a somewhat updated version of the one that has already flown successfully twice, uh, but unlike, it's not totally different like the other instruments are. And finally, there is also, there has to be a new design of the image stabilization and light distribution unit, which distributes the light to all of them in such a way that every instrument gets 100% of the light in its wavelength range, something that DKIST is doing um, but we did that more than 11 years before. Okay. Good. And there is a new gondola system now being provided by APL, uh, Pietro Bernasconi, with whom I did my PhD in Zurich a long time ago, is, is heading that. And this is an early design of this. There is uh, more stuff. You remember, if uh, Michael looks at it, um, carefully, he'll notice the roll cage is missing. That was added afterwards, of course. Otherwise, we'd be in deep trouble when landing. Now, a question 
which I think is quite obvious, is why do you want to fly a one meter telescope when you have a fantastic four meter telescope just around the corner, right? Why? What makes it attractive? I think there are still, what happened? Ah, there are still a few reasons. So the most obvious is the access to the UV. Even with a big telescope, you would have to integrate for such long times that you know, your images would be all smeared out in the UV. And that's discovery space there. Secondly, we will have absolutely seeing free image quality over a large field of view. You don't have to worry about AO or multi-conjugate AO or whatever. You just get it for free. That's the reason you're going up. You can, in principle, for the whole duration of your flight, you can do 24 hours observations. You can follow features being uninterrupted by nighttime because the sun is always shining. So for evolution studies, it can be interesting. You also have the potential just to have long inter uninterrupted time series. This is for the local helioseismology. That's quite an interesting thing to do. Um, and this is a detail maybe, but remember we have two spectrographs in there at totally different wavelengths in the UV and the infrared. Try getting those slits to align below the Earth's atmosphere. Dispersion is just going to kill you, right? It becomes very, very difficult. You're in space or almost in space. You have a chance to do it. It's still very tricky, but you have a chance to do it. So these are just some reasons for, for uh, trying to do that. And I'm nearly at the end. I want to finish basically by showing this picture. And you'll recognize a few, oh, it's a bit dark. Huh? Can you see them? Yeah. So you'll recognize a few people there. So one person, obviously, that is Michael. And he's the only one who's getting a shiny oval around him because it's also in his honor that we are here. But you will see Alice, you'll see Alice with her signature cap sitting over there. Not wearing it today, but we're also inside. Um, over there, there are a bunch of other HAO people and ex-HAO people. There is another lady here, Rebecca. I can see over there. And ah, here's your, uh, what's his name again? Jack, yes, Jack Fox there as well. Uh, and others. I'm sure you'll recognize more. So it was a big team. It was tough to get the things going and working. And yeah, I mean, I was telling Alice earlier, we really remember how she was working almost round the clock for weeks and weeks. I mean, you're not allowed to say that, right? It's illegal almost what she was doing, but uh, she made it work. And everyone, it was, it was a great experience. Thank you.